The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Our next presenter is Bill Wolf. Bill is a senior engineer at Norlight Corporation in New York. Bill is a member of many ACI committees, ACI 213, ACI 301, and ACI 302. And Bill's going to talk to us about the field performance of internally cured concrete bridge decks in New York State. Please, Bill, come forward. Excellent. Can everybody hear me? I'm going to walk around a little bit here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the experience in the field. We've already talked today about some of the theory, some of the research. Let's see some of the practice that's out there. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my co-authors on this paper, uh, Mr. Don Streeter, who had hoped to come and present this, unfortunately due to some travel restrictions with the state that he wasn't able to attend. Also Ron Vaughn from uh, Northeast Solite, and then myself. Some of the things we'll talk about. We'll talk about the uh, history and the background of the program of uh, investigation of internal carrying in the state of New York. Talk about how we developed the mixed designs. Uh, talk a little bit about the batching and placing and curing of concrete out in the field. What did we learn? Uh, what were some of the challenges that we had? And then we'll take a look at a few projects at the end. A little history. New York State um, has about 17,000 bridges. Uh, many of those bridges uh, are in uh, need of repair, very similar to a lot of the structures that you see out in the country. And as far as the DOT, they're working to go ahead and, and repair those structures, and the new ones that they build, they want to take a look at those structures and make sure that they last as long as they can. Uh, we want to get the life cycles up, and they definitely want to get more money out of the structure. So there's improvements out there. There's a lot of different things that they utilize to move in that direction and they felt that internal curing was going to be one of those. Um, they had already utilized high-performance concrete in a lot of their mixed designs for bridge decks. Uh, so they said, all right, we've got this fantastic concrete. Unfortunately, it's cracked. What can we do to help to prevent that? Internal curing's out there. Let's take a look at it. Um, back in 2007, uh, they contracted or, or, or spoke with the Federal Highway so we'll go ahead and put together a program that will investigate the use of internal curing and see how it works in some of the, uh, the structures and the projects that we have within the state itself. So they just don't want to take a look at one or two structures. They wanted to take a look at the number of the structures in the state. Um, up on the map, you see the, the stars kind of coming up. Um, these are the, the different projects that we did throughout the state. Uh, the red stars are projects that have already been constructed. Uh, the yellow stars are the ones that I know aren't planning right now. There's probably more than this, to tell you the truth. Uh, but uh, there's quite a few of them out there. <coughs> it's not just a one or two uh, bridge program. As far as what they were taking a look at, they want to look at a lot of different variables. They want to look at uh, some different bridge types. Um, they wanted to vary the number of spans from just a simple single span to multiple spans. Um, because the state is so big, they want to take a look at a number of different regions, construction regions within the state. Uh, we've got a lot of different climates. They want to take a look at different loadings of the icy chemicals and traffic. And just by the, the nature of the, uh, the program itself, you're going to get different times throughout the year that they cast these structures. Um, they do some in the springtime. Unfortunately, they do some very late in the season, too. It gets late in the construction season. 
Uh, so they're, they're placing the deck, and shortly after we're getting into some heavy freezes. You can see that we've got a number of different climatic regions. Uh, we range from, you know, the heavy snow uh, down to more temperate climate. You look at the climate regions within the state of New York. Uh, you can see up in the northern Adirondacks, you're getting the, the heavy freezes, um, you know, in, in cold, wet summers. And down when you get closer to, to uh, New York City, you get a more moderate climate. You're along the coast. So we've got a, a pretty good uh, array of different climates. As far as precipitation, you can see that we've got a big variance there also. Uh, this area up off the lake, you tend to get a lot of... Um, that's not going to work. Uh, a lot of different uh, lake effect rainfall and snowfall. Uh, we've got some structures in that region too. Um, New York State is famous for, for some of the high snowfalls. You can see in the, the snowball regions uh, down around Watertown, uh, which we do have a couple structures up there. Um, you get snowfalls up over 200 inches. <coughs> Population densities, we talked a little bit about different traffic loadings and whatnot. Um, the red regions are higher population densities. Uh, we've got some structures, a number of structures in those areas. We also have a number of structures that are out in the country. Uh, a little more rural, less traffic loading, and once you put all those variables together, you do have a need to, to take a look at a number of these different structures. All right, as far as the mixed development, like I mentioned, New York State already utilized high-performance concrete. Uh, this is their class HP mix. Um, basically, they're just saying we want a specific cement content. They're also utilizing flash and 7% silica fume in this. Uh, one thing that you will notice as uh, up on the screen, the sand volume is about uh, 40%. We said, all right, we're going to take a look at internal carrying. How are we going to calculate the amount of, uh, in this case, they're utilizing like a battery. Uh, how are we going to do that? We took a look at the Benz equation, uh, put in all the inputs, and they said that's fantastic, uh, but how are we going to apply this to the field? They were a little afraid that it was going to scare a lot of people off. There's a lot of different things that are up there that might confuse a lot of the people in the field. So based on this and this equation, they came up with a 30% replacement of the uh, fine fracture by volume of the sand. So if the lightweight aggregate is going to be about uh, half the density of the normal weight aggregate, you'll take out 400 pounds of sand and put in about 200 pounds of lightweight aggregate. Much simpler, they wrote this into the specification as opposed to using the equation, and it seems to be working quite well. So their class HPIC mix is basically the same thing that we saw before. The only difference is that 40% of sand is divided up and you've got 30% by volume replacement of that fraction. All right, when they took a look at the materials that they were going to use for internal curing, a couple of things that they were uh, felt were important for them. The material needed to be able to hold a sufficient amount of water. They've got a lot of choices there, and we're going to talk about a lot of those today. Uh, the wood fiber, uh, super absorbent polymers, um, lightweight aggregate. Um, lightweight aggregate was kind of a, a material that they knew. They've got a lot of lightweight concrete. Uh, they have some experience with it. Uh, so they decided to go in that direction. Uh, the material had to hold a sufficient amount of water that would be available um, to help with the cure. That water was going to need to remain within uh, the agent that was carrying it until the cement paste called for it. And since it was in there, it's not going to affect the water cement ratio. The other thing is, it needs to get that water up in a relatively high relative humidity. As far as around the state, uh, what did they have that was available? Uh, lightweight aggregate sources, there's three approved sources uh, within the state itself. Uh, they're all expanded shale. They have very similar absorption and desorption properties. And this worked very well for their kind of across the board 30% replacement of the fine fraction. Uh, they're all very similar in strength and relative density. So uh, it made it, uh, made it fairly easy. And it did offer for a competitive situation. It wasn't just a single source. There's three different suppliers. There's other suppliers that could also ship into the area that's available. Um, but the ones that are close that typically service this market 
uh, are all similar in nature. As far as the absorption of the materials, uh, you can see uh, when you normalize this, um, they perform very similarly. Um, the 24-hour absorption on these products is somewhere around 15%, and they all, uh, like I mentioned, they're all very similar. As far as desorption, uh, that's a graph that uh, you've seen a little earlier today. Um, everybody desorb uh, at the same rate or, or a similar rate, um, so they could expect uh, somewhat consistent results if they move from supplier to supplier. All right. Talk a little bit about how to figure out what, did, what did we discover. Well, like we talked about, we want to make sure that there's a proper amount of water within the concrete. Um, as far as the specification for the state, they said, all right, let's take a look at it. We want to make sure there's a minimum of 15% absorbed water. Uh, that's a minimum number. Uh, typically what we saw is up over 20%. Um, the state said we'll go ahead and we'll place that under a sprinkler at a red mix producer site. We want to do that for at least 48 hours. Uh, I know most of the jobs, they probably did closer to over a week uh, to make sure that water was on it. They also wanted to make sure they got into that pile on a regular basis and turned it over and made sure that we got good coverage from top to bottom. Next thing the state said is we want to make sure that pile drains down. They put the specification that they want it to, to drain for somewhere between 12 and 15 hours. This was typically accomplished by going ahead and turning off the sprinklers the night before the pour. When you came in the morning, you had a sufficient drain down time, and it worked quite well. Soaking itself um, was typically done with sprinklers. I know it's kind of tough to see in that picture. Uh, but just a couple sprinklers on top of the aggregate storage pile uh, allowed us to get that sufficient moisture in the soaking on it. Take a look at it in a graphical basis. Um, like I mentioned, after 24 hours, you're up around the 15% number. Uh, once you get a little further out, you get up over 20%. And I think this is pretty typical for all the materials that were used throughout the state. Batching, um, you know, with something new, anything new, uh, with either ready mix producers or the state, you know, it, it, it causes a little bit of grief. And we were kind of pleasantly surprised that uh, it wasn't much different than uh, just batching normal concrete. Um, there was some concern with bin space. Uh, some of the smaller ready mix producers, if they didn't have the bin space uh, to uh, batch the lightweight aggregate, um, they needed to come up with a, a little novel idea. Some of the batch designs had two different stones. So they had needed the bins for those. What the state allowed those fellows to do is go ahead and pre-blend the stone at the aggregate quarry and then test the FM on it and make sure it was in line with what they wanted uh, in the, the finished concrete. And they just put that pre-blended stone for one of the bins. The other bin they could use for, for lightweight aggregate. I also wanted to batch lightweight aggregate first. Just because it's such a small number, you're only looking at you know, 200, 250 pounds that was going into the concrete. Uh, so, some of the batching systems, it's best to do it first to get the accuracy. And then the last thing that's up there is wet sand. There was a little concern. If you talk to somebody about high moisture content, content sands, they're worried they're not going to move through the system too well. One thing that you've got to remember about uh, the saturated lightweight aggregate, it's only the surface moisture that you have to worry about. The high numbers that's absorbed into the internal pores of the aggregate itself, so it's not going to behave like a wet sand. Uh, initially, we did have one ready mix supplier that we had a little bridging in one of his bins. Uh, how we overcame that is we just put more lightweight in it and the weight kind of kind of pushed it down and flowed freely after that. They were a little concerned, so then we put a small amount in. As far as uh, the testing uh, that's done at the ready mix producer, typically the morning of the pour, uh, the state inspectors will come in. They'll calculate out the absorbed and surface moisture of the lightweight aggregate. Typically, they're using the paper towel test to do this. Um, from those numbers, they can adjust the pull weights, and they only adjust the pull weights by the absorbed moisture content. Um, that absorbed moisture content, like we talked about, is not going to affect the water cement ratio because it's held within the pores until after it's set. And then they'll go ahead and reduce the mixed water by uh, just the surface moisture. Testing we came up with is uh, 
what we call a paper towel test. The state wrote uh, a formalized method for this. Basically, you take uh, two samples. One you test for the total moisture. The other one you're going to want a lot to try to get the moisture off the outside. Just using commercially available brown paper towels. And you can see at the beginning, you, you'll suck up a lot of surface moisture. And as you work through it, it becomes less and less until you can't see uh, much of the water coming off the towels itself. You don't want to use something like Bounty or anything like that that has a wicking action. You, know, you want something that's just going to, going to grab a little bit of it. Once you get to this point, what you'll do is you'll, you'll weigh that sample and you'll go ahead and throw it in the oven. Uh, up on the screen, the sample on the right is uh, both the surface and the absorbed moisture, and the one on the left is, um, I guess, with the uh, surface dry. Put these both in, and you can get a total and an absorbed moisture. The difference between the two is the surface moisture. Placing on the field. Most of these jobs were pumped uh, and performed quite well. You didn't get any slump loss, uh, anything along those lines. And the finishability of it uh, was very similar to uh, the other high-performance concrete mixtures that they were used to placing. Uh, some of the contractors did say that uh, it actually performed a little better. It was a little less sticky uh, than the traditional uh, HPC. One of the questions that we always get out in the field, how do you test the air on it? Of course, nobody wants to use a roll meter uh, on the left there. Uh, there's always concerns, so what we did pretty much every job, uh, the first batch out, we ran uh, both a roll meter and a pressure meter, and what we discovered is it's okay to use a pressure meter. Uh, we were always within a half percent, uh, more likely down uh, closer to a quarter percent error. So they used the, the uh, pressure meters on the jobs. Curing, um, like we talked about, Previously, in some of the other presentations, this is not meant to replace surface curing. Uh, they still, the state still wants to surface cure uh, the structures that are out there. They're utilizing wet burlap, and they've got a 14-day wet cure that uh, is in their specifications. All right, we'll take a look at a few bridge decks uh, that were part of the project. Uh, this is in Syracuse, New York, Fourth uh, Street, and uh, this project was done in September 2009 and it was a uh, surface street over Interstate 81. Uh, what we did is we compared Court Street uh, to a, a couple other structures, Spencer Street and Butternut Street, uh, that were very similar structures. They had the same contractor, they had the same ready mix suppliers of so the same materials, and they were done at the same time of the year. So very, very similar. It's a great place for a comparison. Um, this was the non-internally cured mix that you see up there. So you can see, uh, you know, there's a little over 1,100 pounds of sand in this mix. Uh, on the internally cured mix design, you can see that we've got about 200 pounds of the lightweight aggregate. Now, mind you, that's on a dry basis. Uh, so we did the batch design based on the specific gravity for uh, dry lightweight aggregate fines. When we bashed it and we added the moisture in, it was somewhere up around 240, between 240 and 250 pounds that went in, which uh, corresponds uh, very good with uh, the number that Jason talked about, seven pounds per hundred weight of cement. So it fell right into that range. Placement, like I said, it was uh, with a pump. Uh, no problems whatsoever. Um, and this is a typical two-strand structure over the interstate highway. All right, comparison to some of the strength results. You can see up on the screen, on the top is the uh, high performance concrete. Second line down is the internally cured. Uh, you can see in seven days we had uh, about a 2% or 2.8% increase in compressive strength with the internal curing. Uh, 14 days, 5.1% more. Uh, 21 days, 8.1. And then 28 days, 10.6% uh, increase in strength. As far as cracking on these structures, we went ahead and took a look at it. It will look very good for both the internally cured and the non-internally cured. So uh, there wasn't a huge comparison. I haven't walked this deck in probably a couple years. Uh, there was one small crack on both structures in the same place on the sidewalk, right over top of the pier. It's kind of where you would expect to see it. Uh, but it was the same for both of the structures. Uh, this is another project that I actually drove by on the way up. Uh, 
Interstate 190 and 290, the intersection of Buffalo, New York. Uh, this one was a little different. Uh, it had an integral uh, pier cap that was poured at the same time as the deck. Uh, batch design is very, very similar to, to the other things that we've seen as mandated by the state specifications. And the strengths comparing the non-internally cured to the internally cured, they were pretty much the same. Uh, we didn't see a huge difference in the work that we did with this. Another project, uh, this one's getting closer up into the snow belt. Uh, this is north of Syracuse and Cicero, New York. Uh, they probably get, I don't know, 150 inches of snow a year in this location. Uh, but this was a little different. This was uh, concrete uh, girders on this, and the bridge deck was uh, poured in a couple different stages, and uh, they had a closure pour at the end. Mixed design, very similar to the other stuff that you saw uh, in Syracuse, very similar materials. Strengths, just to show that this was field data. Um, we had the, the internal pure concrete was a little less at the beginning. Uh, 14 days, we had an outlier there. I don't know if somebody dropped the cylinder or whatever it was. Uh, but uh, that data is probably not uh, reliable. But out of 28 days, you're showing about a 15% uh, increase in the internal and pure concrete. Last project we'll talk about is one that's relatively recent. This is in Chestertown, New York, on Interstate 87 up in the Adirondacks. Um, this was actually passed just about a month ago. Uh, it was a five-span structure on steel girders. Uh, had an opportunity last week to walk the deck before they opened it for traffic. Uh, the deck looked fantastic. Uh, there was no cracks on it. Also on this project, they did the, the barrier along both sides. They did high-performance concrete without internal curing. That was cracked every four feet, just like clockwork. Uh, you saw small cracks in it, um, so you can definitely see the difference uh, between the two. All right, conclusions that uh, we came up with. Uh, the saturated lightweight fines could definitely help to improve the properties uh, of the concrete. Uh, some of the fears that we saw at the beginning with the ready mix producers uh, were unfounded. It was easily incorporated at the, at the batch plants and work well. It also helped to reduce some of the cracking out there and improve the, the strengths. Um, once again, I want to stress that it's supplementing the conventional curing that we have, and it uh, didn't affect the finishability at all. And definitely the, uh, the state thinks that uh, it's helping to improve the durability of the high-performance concrete that they have.